Blue Leak's law enforcement data is exposed, AMD patches three major flaws, and Zoom adds end-to-end -end encryption for free users. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I am Shannon Morris, and this is ThreatWire for June 24th, 2020. This is your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. I apologize for being a day late on my ThreatWire episode, but it is with good reason. Yesterday, I adopted a puppy, so that took up most of the day, but it was very, very exciting. Stick around through the episode to meet her. I'll try to bring her on as in real life on. I don't know how it's gonna work out putting her here in the studio, but we will see. But for now, on to the news. Big thanks to Gnome for sending this story my way via our Patreon Discord. Nearly 270 gigabytes of law enforcement data has been leaked via a security breach at a Texas-based web design and hosting company called NetCentral, of which manages law enforcement data portals for lots and lots of states. The leak is called Blue Leaks, and it was published by DDoS Secrets, which is Distributed Denial of Secrets, which acts as a transparency collective and publishes a cache for secret data posts. The leak includes hundreds of thousands of sensitive files on police departments across the U.S., according to Krebs on Security, from 10 years in over 200 police departments, fusion centers, which are information dissemination programs, law enforcement officer training, and support resources. This also includes police and FBI guides, reports, and a lot more. According to Twitter posts, by DDoS secrets. This includes thousands of documents that mention COVID-19, and the leak includes intelligence centers, FBI academics, analysis and assessment centers, and the data includes some sensitive information like emails, routing and bank account numbers, and personally identifying information of suspects and cases. Images, documents, videos, text files, audio, and a lot more are also included in the dump. Now, some data pertain to recent protests showing images of clothing, signs, and cars that were seen at protests, and deemed potential threats, showing that law enforcement is closely tracking information on people demonstrating across the nation. Krebs validated the leak through an internal analysis from the National Fusion Center Association, showing that this is legit, and NetCentral also confirmed a threat actor gained access to their platform. A torrent of the data is currently available online, although according to former Assistant Secretary of Policy at the DHS, Stuart Baker, it is not likely to uncover any information about police misconduct, as fusion centers do not actually work on that kind of information. AMD disclosed three high severity flaws in clients and embedded processors that were released between 2016 to 2019 that could allow an attacker to execute malicious code or take control of firmware if they have physical access or had already infected a target to gain privileged access. These are CVE 2020-14032-12890, and the third one does not have a CVE at time of recording. Only the first one has been patched. The the last two should be available as patches by the end of the month. AMD has labeled these as SMM callout privilege escalation bugs that affect AMD software technology that is embedded on motherboards from various manufacturers for the use in their UFI or the Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. AMD posted a bulletin about these on the 17th. Now SMM stands for System Management Mode and sets the CPU and chipset configurations as well as motherboard trusted platform module and power management configs as well. SMM is a part of the UFI on microprocessors made by Intel and AMD, but Intels are not vulnerable to the same exploit. The SMM vulnerability exists because it lacks several different kinds of checks that validate argument strings in code before they are actually processed. Security researcher Danny Oldler found the issues in April and has published an analysis of the first flaw, although he will likely publish more information on the other ones once they are patched. According to his analysis, the problems occur on AMD's accelerated processing unit microprocessors tested on an AMD mini PC. Even though AMD says that this would require physical or privileged access to the machine already, they do recommend keeping devices up to date as soon as manufacturing partners release the patches. Before we hit story number three, I wanted to say thank you so much to my supporters over at patreon.com 
slash threatwire. My Hush Puppy Perk level patrons can send in their fur baby photos each week to be featured on the show, but this week I actually wanted to show off my fur baby. Yay, puppers. Hey, sweetie. Oh, sorry if she hits the microphone. This is Sookie. I wanted to introduce her. This is my fur baby. She's so cute. She's four months old and you will probably see her on my Twitter. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, twitter.com slash snubs, that's where you can see Sookie. Hi, baby. She just woke up from a nap. That's why she's so tired. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> She's so cute. I love her. Also, a new perk has been added. Now everyone who becomes a patron will get access to ongoing discounts from my online store, which is over at snubsy.com shop. So you will get a 10 to 20% off of any merch that you buy there, including show stickers, digital photography, t-shirts, pretty much anything, just for being a Patreon supporter at any level. There is so much to cover in security and privacy, I never have time to discuss everything in these episodes, so if you want to see me cover more InfoSec news as an audio podcast, or even a second episode of ThreatWire each week, make sure to check out the next Patreon goal to see how you can help make that happen. So y'all remember how Zoom was all like, end-to-end -end encryption will only be for paid users. Yeah, they backtracked on that. So high five, privacy advocates, go us. Psh. Yeah, on Wednesday, Zoom stated that they will make end-to-end -end encryption available for both their paying and their non-paying customers for video conferencing. Zoom originally stated that it would only be available to paying subscribers while giving free users transit encryption, which would still allow law enforcement access to data and calls. In-transit encryption is not as secure as E2EE since data is not encrypted at rest, and we were rightly critical of this approach given that true True encryption should be available and accessible to everyone. Zoom is making this possible by asking users to authenticate accounts by verifying with a phone number via text message to reduce mass creation of spam or abusive accounts. Zoom's statement showed that they are confident this will be good for risk-based authentication to continue preventing and fighting abuse on the platform. Now this is similar to signups with Signal, where you have to have a phone number to authenticate. And while this is not 100% anonymous, it does give free users access to end-to-end -to -end encryption. Now, E2EE on Zoom will be opt-in for everyone since, according to the CEO, this limits some functionality like calling in via a phone line. So before I leave, I want to say thank you so much to Minhea, John, and Max, who joined the Patreon team this week. Thank you so much to each and every one of you. You are awesome. And with that, do not forget to like and subscribe. I'm Shannon Morse, and I will see you on the internet.